I started thinking about data intensely uh, from my very first conversation with him, where we talked about the internet as an open platform and uh, data as one of the things that makes this platform different than other platforms in terms of the fact that you know you normally think, okay, it's a set of code built upon an operating system or something like that, but actually this platform, the data is the platform. And it was that, uh, various food camps, we were the fortune to get invited to a Friends of O'Reilly camp I recommended to you, and LinkedIn and investments that made me think about the theme uh, that I'm talking to you about today, which is, you know, how are we, what are we stumbling towards in terms of Web 3.0 and how data is really key to that. So remember what Web 1.0. Web 1.0 was this low, really low bandwidth environment. I don't know how many of you are going to look at me strangely when I say this, but I remember being excited by getting a 2400 baud mode. <laughs> and it's probably the people who weren't copying probably don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> and so, um, uh, you know, Web 1.0 was this environment by which we would go out and we'd search for files. HTML files, right, this is file format. A PDF splash, we bring them back. There was this uh, you know, kind of notion of going into cyberspace. And it was kind of this alternative, strange reality. You didn't actually go there as Reed Hoffman with my relationships around him. You went there as you know, an anime fan or lost in Austin. <laughs> and you, you, know, you might be uh, you were kind of vaguely worried that maybe some thief would steal your credit card number. And if you were chatting someone up, you were worried that they were a balding old man. <laughs> and that was kind of what Web 1.0 Web was. Web 2.0, the, the central part of the revolution, which you know, Tim has also written a lot about, is where we come, where the web and real life uh, essentially become much more integrated, where our presence online is our real name, our real relationship. And the apps, that are the applications that are built on top of this are things that help us navigate our real relationships, the relationships we already have, the world that we're already navigating. And so it becomes something that is much more uh, deeply embedded in terms of what we're doing. And so let me go through a bunch of the prospects that people have said about Web3, not because, you know, again, semantics not interesting, but because the, uh, the what should we invent and where should we be going, and where is all this technological change leading us, is important to both be thoughtful about and also how we create the future. So the kind of definitions I've heard about Web3 are it's about bandwidth, it's about the application of the web, it's about video, especially with bandwidth, right? it's location, it's real time, right? it's mobile. Uh, let's see, I think there's probably some more. Uh, and of all those, I would say mobile is probably the most relevant. Because, you know, if you haven't seen iPhones and Androids everywhere, I don't know, you know which part of the, the, the developed world you're living in, obviously, it's still spreading. But that's kind of boring and uninteresting, right? It's clear that the real time with us uh, and how our identities and relationships get expressed to that is going to be very important. The reason I go to data is because this is the progression I see between Web 1, Web 2, and Web 3. And what I think is going to be really interesting in terms of the kinds of applications we can build and the kind of future we can build. Web 1, you know, go search, get data, weird interactivity. Web 2, our real identities, our real relationships. As our real identities and real relationships, we are generating a massive amount of data. We are blogging, we are tweeting, we are status updating, we are uploading photos. It's not just explicit data, we're also uh, essentially implementing, you know, doing implicit data. In fact, we turn on a phone, right, with a GPS location. And then there's the analytic data that goes on top of that, uh, which is when we munge that data, with just algorithms or with other data sources and else, and generate analytic categories of data. And my belief is that Web3 is going to be, if, if there is a, 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 an important thing to look forward to what we can invent, it's what are we inventing out of that data. And the reason why Web3 is new and unique is because we didn't have 
all of this mass of data that all of us are generating, right? Even here, uh, actually, especially, and here the little uh, the, the, the uh, keyboard clicks, <laughs> here in this audience right now. When I think about how do we construct this future, I think that the, the key thing is to think about what are we doing with this data. And part of it, as you'll see, I kind of have two parts to, to try to give, you know, uh, uh, you know, I try to do as compact chunks as possible in terms of how to think about things. One is about data, and the other one later we'll get to is about entrepreneurship. And in terms of data, there's at least two really important rules that we all need to think about when we're constructing these services. The first rule is never ambush your users. Your users, if they have trust with you and they're building trust by coming to it, come to your site, they leverage it, they use it, right? And you have to make sure that what you're doing, what you ask them to do, and what happens with the data never puts them in a position, right, where they feel ambushed, where something bad has happened. And you probably can't prevent it absolutely 100% of the time, just as the same way you can't prevent a car accident from happening when you're driving to the airport, because you're not the only person in control. But you can say that the absolute thing is, in terms of preserving trust data, is never ambush your users. The second is that not all data is created equal. A lot of these discussions about data, privacy, truth, etc., presumes that it's like, well, it's data about the user. Well, some data is actually pretty important, and some data is not that important. So the data that you know, I mail 43, you know, uh, live in Silicon Valley, etc. That's actually not, you know, you know, other than the government worries that I mentioned before, that's actually not all that concerning. <laughs> However, data that is essentially equivalent to a password, because I and there's a bunch of different people say, well, yeah, passwords, of course, you know, those are the credentials by which you come to the system. But actually, there's a number of passwords we have in our lives and we don't quite think about that way. Your credit card number is actually part of your password to your payments account. <laughs> uh, the fact that what dollar mortgage you pay on your house or what rent you pay is something that's sometimes invented as, a, as an identification identifier for a password. So how you deal with this kind of information is actually really critical. So these kinds of things, when you're building these data systems, are really key in order to make sure that you steer through the kind of dystopia possibilities or the ambushing possibilities and in, ter in terms of and then build towards what can be really good.